This week's block of scripture in this presentation that we will be considering and giving insights and commentary on is Alma chapters 5 through 7. So let's begin with Alma chapter 5. Now, this is quite a long and lengthy chapter full of some of the most profound doctrine in the Book of Mormon. So these three chapters may be a lengthy presentation, but hopefully you can endure to the end and gain some great insights and things that will help stay on the covenant path and live the gospel and come unto Christ. First of all, by way of introduction to chapter 5, Alma yielded up the judgment seat so that he might go forth among the people of Nephi to stir them up in remembrance of their duty, bearing down in pure testimony against them. The record of his labors among the people of Zarahemla and the people of Gideon allows us to reflect upon our own spiritual standing before the Lord. As you study these chapters, consider how Alma's questions counsel and testimony can help you remember your duty towards God and your fellow man. Look for what brings about spiritual rebirth and for what will help you emulate the attributes of the Savior. So with that in mind, let's start with Alma chapter 5. Chapter 5 verses 1 through 9. History is the collective memory of a people. Its lessons are most poignant and should be written in our hearts and souls. It is a reservoir of wisdom for which we need to drink deeply and frequently. It is the past that we find direction for the present and the future. The annuals of the faithful inevitably give us reason for gratitude and humility, out of which grow a renewed sense of obligation. Thus, Alma's recounting of the history or the people of how they were baptized in the waters of Mormon, brought into bondage by the Lamanites, and then delivered out of bondage by the power of God. Then Alma asked the people if they had sufficiently retained in remembrance these things, and how God delivered them out of their deep sleep, and in the marvelous light of how the bands of death were broken, and the chains of hell were loosed, enabling them to sing redeeming love. You can see that knowing the past and remembering or reflecting upon it helps us to be humble and to recognize it is God who got us through it. Alma chapter 1, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, the phrase, Alma began to deliver up the word of God. Introducing the ministry of the Savior, Matthew recorded that Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Such is everlastingly the pattern among the Lord's prophets. They are ambassadors of the word of God, teachers of eternal principles, witnesses of the verities of heaven, with no claim on mortal men for their power, authority, or message. Chapter 5, verse 2, the phrase, according to his own record. Mormon here indicates that he is about to quote from the record of Alma. So this is directly from Alma and not necessarily Mormon's abridgment of the words of Alma in this chapter. Sounds like he is directing quote the, the words, directly, directly quoting the words of Alma. Alma 5, verse 3, the phrase consecrated a high priest over the church of God meant one does not properly preach, save he has been properly called. Here Alma establishes that such is the case with him. He has been consecrated by his father, meaning that he had been properly called and set apart to his holy office according to the pattern of the priesthood, which is the same in all ages. He holds the office of high priest and is the presiding officer in the church. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, God's chief representative on earth, the one who holds the highest spiritual position in his kingdom in any age, is called the high priest. This special designation of the chief spiritual officer of the church has reference to the administrative position which he holds, rather than to the office to which he is ordained in the priesthood. End of his McConkie's quote. Chapter 5, verse 7. 
How does one describe the process of redemption or second birth? Alma used such imagery as a changed heart, a soul awakened out of a deep sleep, and the prisoner of darkness being freed to stand in the light. His illustrations are apt. Chapter 5, verse 7, the phrase, Behold, he changed their hearts, meant, Alma, in sorrow, recalled to his listeners' minds the wicked intents that filled the hearts of their fathers in Lehi-Nephi, and also the hearts of some of them that now, now heard his words. He reminded them that in the land all but a few rejected the words of God's holy prophets. But Alma said that the Lord changed their hearts. As before they took pleasure in evil, they now rejoice in sobriety. There was a change within, therefore there was a change without. The things they once hated, they now love. What once they drew closely to their bosoms, they now despise. A keen desire to do no more evil, but to do good, reigns supreme in their hearts. Light, love, joy, and peace, God's most precious gift, overflowed their very existence. Nor was that all. Knowledge from heaven illuminated their souls, waters from the wells of salvation slacked their thirst. The words of God's servants became meat to their once improvised being. The Lord awakened them out of a deep sleep, and they awoke unto God. The phrase in verse 7, Behold, they were in the midst of darkness, refers to. Darkness, as used here, means error, unbelief, or ignorance. The darkness which enshrouded the Nephites and Lehi-Nephi was dispelled because God's holy word and the preaching thereof by his servants brought light where formerly darkness prevailed. The words of this verse remind us of the words of Isaiah and also of King David. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For in thy light we shall see. Alma define the chains of hell as being brought in subjection to the adversity and placing ourselves at risk for everlasting destruction. Chapter 5, verse 9, the phrase, they did sing redeeming love, meant, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely, says the psalmist in 147. Surely all within the household of faith ought to acknowledge the greatness of their God in songs of praise. As DNC 25 says, For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with the blessing upon their heads. Wherefore, lift up thy heart and rejoice, and cleave unto the covenants which thou hast made. Songs of praise to our God help sanctify and cleanse our souls. Inspired music lifts the soul, teaches the gospel, and builds and sustains our faith. The Lord's people sing the song of redeeming love when they break forth in anthems of praise and gratitude to the Almighty, and when they affirm by testimony the greatness and goodness of God. That gives us some insight, maybe, how we should sing in our sacrament meetings and other meetings from our heart. The phrase in verse 9, they are saved, meant to be saved is to be freed from the effects of Adam's fall, to overcome death and hell, to know a fullness of joy. It is to inherit eternal life. Ours is a lost and fallen world in which the soul is temporarily imprisoned. Salvation in the full and complete sense is to be redeemed or freed from the pains and sorrows of mortality and to rejoice in the glories of eternal splendor. Joseph Smith states, quote, Salvation is for a man to be saved from all his enemies, for until a man can triumph over death, he is not saved. A knowledge of the priesthood alone will do this, end of quote. One can obtain the promise of salvation in this life, but one must pass through death and resurrection to receive complete salvation. Salvation or exaltation comes to the faithful in the life beyond. Chapter 5, verse 10, the phrase, Now I ask of you, on what conditions are ye saved? Yea, what grounds had they to hope for a salvation? 
what is the cause of their being loosed from the bands of death, yea, and also the chains of hell? All this refers to, from this point on until the end of the chapter, Alma starts asking a series of questions so that they would ponder upon the state of our souls. We should take the time to personally answer his questions to evaluate our spiritual condition. These questions were perhaps the greatest ones Alma could ask. The answer to them embraces the whole plan of life and salvation. It begins with the story of man's immortal spirit, and that, as yet, is incomplete. God's love for his children is its major portion. His love for them is interwoven throughout the entire fabric of his, hev of heavenly fa of his Father's devotion. His righteous purposes... His holy mind and will are pledged to our welfare. It is his work and glory to make our salvation sure. Alma now asked, what grounds have they to hope for salvation? We immediately answered, God's love. That answer in itself is all embraced and explains his long suffering towards us. His denial of any right to act for us that we may act for ourselves. His justice and mercy. In his loving kindness, he has prepared the way in which we are loosed from the bands of death, yea, and also the chains of hell. In that way, which is the plan of salvation, we may find a complete and satisfactory answer to Alma's questions. Chapter 5, verse 11, the question, I can tell you, did not my father Alma believe in the words which were delivered by the mouth of Abinadi, and was he not a holy prophet? The crowning evidence that Abinadi was a prophet rests in the fact that he preached the word of God. It is generally supposed that a prophet must foretell the future. This is not necessarily so. The primary responsibility of a prophet is to be a teacher of the word of God and to bear personal witness of Christ. As it says in Revelation 19.10, for the spirit, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the main job of a prophet is to testify of Jesus Christ. As necessary in a prophet, prophets may prophesy future events. Such prophecies, however, are of little or no value independent of the inspired declaration of the truths of salvation. Indeed, faith comes by hearing the heaven-sent word as taught by the servants of God, which testimony is always accompanied by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. A mighty change in his heart, a mighty change in their hearts. Have ye experienced a mighty change in your hearts? That phrase means... President Marion G. Romney of the First Presidency described conversion, experiencing a mighty change of heart as a transformation process involving and affecting every aspect of one's life. Quote, the verb convert means to turn from one belief or course to another. And conversion is a spiritual and moral change attending a change of belief with conviction. As used in the scriptures, converted generally implies not merely mental acceptance of Jesus and his teachings, but also a motivating faith in him and in his gospel, a faith which works a transformation, an actual change in one's understanding of life's meaning and in one's allegiance to God, in interest, in thought, and in conduct. While conversion may be accomplished in stages, one is not really converted in the full sense of the term unless and until he is at heart a new person. So we shed the natural man, the old man, and we literally become a new man and receive a new heart. That is what we are working on. End of his quote. President Ezra Taft Benson shared some characteristics of those who have experienced a mighty change of heart. He said, quote, When you choose to follow Christ, you choose to be changed. The Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums. Christ takes the slums out of the people, and then they take themselves 
out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men who then change their environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change human nature. Yes, Christ changes men, and changes, changed men can change the world. Men changed for Christ will be captained by Christ. Like Paul, they will be asking, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Peter stated they will follow his steps. John said they will walk even as he walked. Finally, men captained by Christ will be consumed in Christ. To, prepare, to paraphrase President Harold B. Lee, they set fire in others because they are in fire. End of quote. And that would be in fire from the Holy Ghost. See, that's why all of our social welfare programs in government do not work. They're trying to take, change people from the outside in. It only works if you change the inside, and then people will change the outside. That's how it works. That's why we will never eradicate poverty through government social programs. Only through God and his law of consecration. Their will is swallowed up in his will. They do always these things to please the Lord. I'm sorry, this is still quoting President Benson. Not only would they die for the Lord, but more importantly, they want to live for him. Enter their homes and the pictures on their walls, the books on their shelves, the music in the air, their words and acts reveal them as Christians. They stand as a witness of God at all times, in all things, and in all places. They have Christ on their minds as they look unto him in every thought. They have Christ in their hearts as their affections are placed on him forever. Almost every week they partake of the sacrament and witness anew to their eternal father that they are willing to take upon them the name of his son, always remember him, and keep his commandments. End of President Benson's quote. The heart can be a symbol for the entire soul, the source of life and power in all that we do. To experience a mighty change of heart and in our hearts is to gain a full and complete commitment to the gospel cause. It is to be filled with spiritual vigor. It is to have the soul consecrated to the upbuilding of the kingdom. And we do that no matter what happens, no matter what persecution, no matter what mistakes leaders may make, because they are human too, our leaders are not infallible, we will have a complete commitment to the covenant path and stay on it and endure to the end. Chapter 5, verse 14. The question, have ye spiritually been born of God? Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described how conversion leads to being born again. He said, quote, conversion means to turn with. Conversion is a turning from the ways of the world to and staying with the ways of the Lord. Conversion includes repentance and obedience. Conversion brings a mighty change of heart. Thus, a true convert is born again, walking with the newness of life. As true converts, we are motivated to do what the Lord wants us to do and to be who he wants us to be. End of his quote. The prophet Joseph Smith stated that being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described what a true miracle it is to be born again. Quote, perhaps the greatest miracle is the healing of sick souls so that those who are spiritually blind and deaf and diseased become again pure and clean and heirs of salvation. Perhaps the greatest miracle of all is that which happens in life to each person who is born again who receives the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit of God in his life, who has, sinned and, who has sin and evil burned out of his soul as though by fire, who lives again spiritually. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 14, the phrase, Have you received his image in your countenance? One measure of the new birth is the appearance of a new man. Paul described the process of being 
process of salvation as obtaining the mind of Christ. That is, learning to think as Christ thinks, believe as he believes, feel as he feels, and do as he would do. Peter described the same thing as partaking of the divine nature, meaning that we must acquire the attributes of godliness. Joseph Smith explained, quote, The Savior most clearly showed us unto us the nature of salvation and what he proposed unto the human family when he proposed to save them, that he proposed to make them like unto himself, and he was like the Father, the great prototype of all saved beings, and for any portion of the human family to be assimilated into their likeness is to be saved, and to be unlike them is to be destroyed, and on this hinge turns the door of salvation." As a child learns by, in, by in, imitating and emulating parents and those older than himself, so we learn godliness by imitating others who have set an example in righteousness, especially Jesus Christ. Alma appropriately describes this process of becoming Christ-like as receiving the image of Christ in our countenances. Chapter 5, verse 15, the question, do you exercise faith in the redemption? To exercise faith in the redemption of Christ is to have perfect confidence that in Christ is found the power to remit sin, heal the souls, raise the dead, and triumph in all that is right and good. It is to trust the simplicity of gospel answers. It is to seek the sanction of heaven on all that one does. The phrase in verse 15, our question, do you look forward with an eye of faith? To have an eye of faith is to be believing. It is to see the hand of God in all things. It is the confidence that all things will work together for our good if we walk uprightly and are true to our covenants. Even if the things we are going through are trials and are fictions, we have confidence that even that will work together for all our good. You remember what the Savior said to Joseph in Liberty Jail when he was going through all that suffering and pain and the pain of the saints being persecuted by the Missourians. The Lord said, don't worry, Joseph. All of this will be for thy good. And so will all of our afflictions and trials and infirmities. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 17 can you imagine to yourselves that phrase, when at last your labors on earth are finished and the great day of the Lord shall come in your imagination, can you hear his voice saying unto you that your works on earth have been the works of righteousness? God wants us to think upon that. Can we imagine that being said? If I can't imagine him saying those words, then maybe I need to then start asking, what do I need to change in my life so that I can imagine hearing those words? Therefore, come unto me and partake of my goodness and my glory. Or do you imagine that in his mercy you can deceive the Lord and falsely claim that your works on earth were good? And in the midst of his and, and in the mistaken testimony which you give, he will save you. In other words, do you think you can really deceive God? Many of us imagine that at the time and in that day when we stand before the Lord to be judged, we will escape the just rewards of merit or demerit because our deeds will be unknown to him. If you do, just remember Psalms 94, 9 through 11. He that planteth the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastened the heart, shall he not, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. All our works are known unto God. How foolish and dark the mind that supposeth person can lie to God, hide their sins and excuse, and cleanse his soul with words of fulsome praise. Why would anyone reverence a God so easily deceived by fools? And of what pleasure would a heaven be that was filled with such beings? Great questions to contemplate. Brothers and sisters, we will hide nothing from God. 
chapter 5, verse 18. The question, can you imagine yourselves being brought before the tribunal of God, tribunal of God, with your souls filled with guilt and remorse? Addressing himself to those who suppose that they can enter the kingdom of heaven unworthily, Moroni said, Behold, I say unto you that you would be more miserable to dwell with the holy and just God under a consciousness of your filth before them than you to dwell with the damned souls in hell. For behold, when ye shall be brought to see your nakedness before God and also the glory of God and the holiness of Jesus Christ, it will kindle a flame of unquenchable fire upon you. The phrase or a perfect remembrance of all your wickedness meant Jacob testified that we will have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt and our uncleanliness and our nakedness when we stand before the judgment bar meaning those not repented of. There can be no justice in the judgment unless the eyes of God are all seen. Repentance alone has the power to edit from the book of life the account of unworthy deeds. Chapter 5, verse 19. Can you look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands, he asks? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? The ancient psalmist asked, and in response he wrote, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation." So those that have clean hands and pure hearts are those that don't lift up into the vain, their soul into the vain things of the world. They don't focus on the vain things of the world, nor they do not swear deceitfully, meaning they don't make oaths deceitfully. When they partake of the commandment and they make those oaths, they are bound to keep them. If you know you're not going to pay tithing, do not partake of the sacrament because you're promising that you will. And if you take it and then do not pay tithing, if you partake of the sacrament and then do not pay your tithing, then you are swearing deceitfully. Thus, you do not have a pure heart. Elder Dallin H. Oaks has written, quote, If we do righteous acts and refrain from evil acts, we have clean hands. If we act for the right motives and if we refrain from forbidden desires and attitudes, we have pure hearts. End of quote. Alma Alma's appeal to his listeners was direct. He carried his message right into their hearts. He did not seek with a show of great emotion to soften the blows he delivered, nor did he excuse any evil existing among his people. Profoundly and with a feeling of deep concern, he denounced the iniquities of which some were guilty. Alma portrayed the awful state in which one will find himself at the last moment when naked, with nothing to hide under. He must acknowledge before God his wickedness while in the flesh. Alma also asked all those in his congregation to imagine if they could, if they could, their remorse, if when standing in God's presence they remember perfectly every time while on earth they defiled his holy laws or rejected his commandments. In this we are reminded of the words of Ezekiel, quote, And there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings, wherein ye have been defiled, and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. Again, referring to those not repented of, and then having to stand before God naked before him, and our whole lives exposed before him. The, serious, the seriousness of evinced by Alma in his queries made the counsel he gave more convincing. Yet every sentence he spoke, each word he said, was interwoven with a fatherly love as for a wayward child. He did not condemn them, only their wicked ways. He admonished them all that when they, that they should come, they would be able to look up to God, have clean hands, and with a pure heart. Chapter 5, verse 19, the phrase, The image of God engraven upon your countenance. While serving as an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Eldor Theodore M. Burton observed that those who follow Heavenly Father appear more like Him. He said, quote, If we truly accept God in our lives and live in accordance with His commandments, God will work a mighty change in our appearance, and we will begin to appear more like Heavenly Father, in whose image we have been created. 
Could it be this appearance we recognize when we meet men and women who are trying to live close to the Lord? End of quote. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency recounted experience in which an associate of the church remarked concerning light in the countenance of Latter-day Saint students. Quote, I, recalled, I recently recalled a historical meeting in Jerusalem about 17 years ago. It was regarding the lease for the land on which the Brigham Young University Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies was later built. Before this lease could be signed, President Ezra Taft Benson and Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, then president of Brigham Young University, agreed with the Israeli government on behalf of the church and of the university not to proselyte in Israel. You might wonder why we agreed not to proselyte. We were required to do so in order to get the building permit to build that magnificent building which stands in the historic city of Jerusalem. To our knowledge, the church and BYU have scrupulously and honorably kept that non-proselyting commitment. After the lease had been signed, one of our friends insightfully remarked, Oh, we know that you are not going to proselyte, but what are you going to do about the light in their eyes? He was referring to our students who were studying in Israel. They could see that they were different and their appearance was different and that they had a light in their eyes. Isn't that interesting? Chapter 5, verse 20. Can you think of being saved when you have yielded yourselves to become subject to the devil? A darn good question. Those who have labored in opposition to the kingdom of God can hardly expect an honored place in that kingdom. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 22. For there can no man be saved except his garments are washed white. How will any of you feel if you stand before the Lord, bar of God, having your garments stained with blood and all manner of filthiness? Those are two quotes from 21 and 22. No principle is better understood among the ancient saints than that no unclean thing could enter the presence of the Lord. Thus the imagery common to the scriptures is to depict the saints of God, those living righteous lives, as wearing robes of righteousness or garments of salvation. This imagery is closely associated with the temple, which is the earthly representation of the divine presence or our sought-after heavenly abode. In the temple, we are taught primarily with symbolic representation how we return to the presence of God. The garments of salvation are also a symbol of divine protection. Nephi sought such a blessing in this language. O Lord, wilt thou encircle me about in the robes of righteousness? O Lord, wilt thou make a way for mine escape before mine enemies? Wilt thou make my path straight before me? Wilt thou not place a stumbling block in my way? Wilt thou not place a stumbling block in my way, but that thou wouldest clear my way before me and hedge not up my way? but the ways of my enemy. The phrase garment stained with blood meant a soul spoiled by the effects of sin. The reference to garments in Alma 5.22 represents our spiritual standing before the Lord. Elder Lynn A. Mickelson of the Quorum of Seventy identified the similarity between the cleansing received through the atonement and the washing of soiled laundry. Quote, there is a parallel between our garments being washed clean through the blood of the Lamb and how we wash our dirty linen. It is through his atoning sacrifice that our garments will be cleansed. The scriptural reference to garments encompasses our whole being. The need for a cleansing comes as we become soiled through sin. The judgment and forgiving are the judgment and forgiving are the Savior's prerogative, for only He can forgive and wash away our sins. There are many who are servants of evil. They are those who have become subject to the temptations of hell and have yielded to its bland, blandishments. With no thought of repenting, they give little heed to else than worldly things. If there be a hereafter, they say, we hope to be saved. 
But Alma offered no excuse for them or for those who defiantly reject God's commands. There is another class for whom Alma presented no apology. There are they who, with spirits untroubled, do as the devil wishes. For them who continue in so doing, Alma said that there is no hope for everlasting life in God's kingdom. Besides that, many are careless of what the Lord requires. They have no just provocation in relaxing their efforts to further his cause. They are given to dalliance and are trifling with the Lord. They care nothing for his holy word and decry every endeavor to please him. Carelessness is wickedness. We rank it next to a wanton disregard of God's holy laws. The gospel of Jesus Christ, mortality, brothers and sisters, is serious business. Chapter 5, verse 21, the phrase, Yea, his garments must be purified until they are cleansed from all sin. A good and proper comment on this verse may be had by reading the following passages of Book of Mormon scripture. 1 Nephi 12, 10 through 11. And these twelve ministers whom thou beholdest shall judge thy seed. And behold, they are righteous forever. For because of their faith in the Lamb of God, their garments are made white in his blood. And the angel said unto me, Look, and I looked, and beheld three generations passed away in righteousness. And their garments were white, even like unto the Lamb of God. And the angel said unto me, These are made white in the blood of the Lamb because of their faith in him. Alma chapter 7 verse 25 says, And many of the Lord, and may the Lord bless you and keep your garments spotless, that you may at last be brought to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob, and the holy prophets who have been ever since the world began, having your garments spotless, even as their garments are spotless in the kingdom of heaven, to go no more out. Alma 13, 11 through 12 says this way, Now as I said concerning the holy order of this holy priest, this high priesthood, there were many who were ordained and became high priests of God. And it was account of their exceeding faith and repentance and their righteousness before God. They chose to repent and work righteousness rather than to perish. Therefore they were called after this holy order and were sanctified and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Now they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. And there were many, exceedingly great many, who were made pure and entered into the rest of the Lord their God. Alma 34:36 says, And this I know, because the Lord hath said, He dwelleth not in unholy temples, but in the hearts of the righteous doth he dwell. Yea, he has also said that the righteous shall sit down in his kingdom to go no more out, but their garments should be made white through the blood of the Lamb. 3 Nephi 19.25 says, And it came to pass that Jesus blessed them as they did pray unto him, and his countenance did smile upon them, and the light of his countenance did shine upon them. And behold, they were as white as the countenance, and also the garments of Jesus. And behold, the whiteness thereof did exceed all the whiteness. Yea, even there could be nothing upon her so white as the whiteness thereof. 3 Nephi 27.19 says, And no unclean thing can enter in the kingdom. Therefore, nothing enters into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness to the end. Brothers and sisters, it is expedient and extremely important that we wash our garments, our souls, our lives, in the blood of the Lamb, so that they become white and pure, as Christ is white and pure. Chapter 5, verse 23, the phrase, Ye are murderers. Reference is not being made to the taking of life, but rather to the destruction of souls, the killing of spiritual sensitivities. Isn't that interesting, that destroying someone else's soul by false doctrine or getting to commit sin or whatever is akin to murder. They use the analogy of murdering. Chapter 5, verse 24. Salvation has little or nothing to do with office or callings. It is dependent upon prominence in the earthly kingdom. Rather, 
it is not dependent on prominence in the earthly kingdom, meaning our callings that we hold is not what qualifies us for eternal life. Rather, salvation is the revolt of living in such a manner that our garments, that is our souls, are cleansed and are spotless, pure and white. All who do this are entitled to sit down with people such as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to obtain the same eternal blessings and rewards as they receive. Whether you have a high visible calling as a say, president, bishop, apostle, prophet, whatever, or just a regular member of the church, it does not matter. The important thing is that we are cleansed and made spotless and pure, not the callings that we hold. We sometimes put too much emphasis on callings in this church, and we need to stop that. We reverence them and respect them, but we don't worship callings. Chapter 5, verse 25, Except you make our Creator a liar from the beginning, you cannot suppose that such can have a place in the kingdom of heaven, meant in the beginning God decreed or promised eternal life in his kingdom to everyone who obeyed his word and served him well. That promise was to all his children, those who were afar and those who were near. God did not promise those who disobeyed him or who made and loved a lie a place in a celestial abode. He hates a liar. In fact, in Second Nephi, I believe, or First Nephi, it says, the liar shall be thrust down to hell. The Lord is God of truth. Not only is he a God of truth, but God now and forever. No qualifying article is needed before his great name. The Lord is God, and besides him there is none other. He speaks only that which is true, and his word endures throughout all eternity. He lies not. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He hath said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God's purposes are eternal. His promises will all be fulfilled. Whether those promises are blessings to the righteous or punishment to the wicked. We, in turn, have no place in the kingdom of heaven if we love a lie and make it our portion. If we follow that one who is the father of lies, being Satan, our place is with him in his kingdom and not with the blessed in the kingdom of God. We are indeed the children of the devil in the same sense and by the same sign as the righteous are the children of God. We have the agency to choose whose children we will belong to. To suppose that the unclean, those who have disdained works of righteousness, can enter the kingdom of heaven is not only to suppose that mercy can rob justice, but it also to make God a liar. The idea not only denies the nature of God, but also destroys the nature of the celestial world. It would make heaven but an endless extension of earth life in which good and evil would continue their war with each other. Chapter 5, verse 26, the phrase, Can you feel so now? This is a call to keep our witness and our experience with the Spirit current and up to date. Though it is important to develop and maintain reservoirs of faith, repositories of memories and experiences and encounters with divine, which have built and strengthened testimony, we must be ever on guard against spiritual lethar lethargy, against coasting upon our memories, against living only in the past. We cannot afford to pause and homestead on spiritual plat plat plateaus. Our task is to move on, to progress. We must constantly, in other words, be having spiritual experiences. Chapter 5, verse 27, the phrase, keeping yourself blameless before God. There is power in living blameless that cannot otherwise be known. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, wrote the Apostle John, then we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. In like manner, Joseph Smith taught that if we will let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly, our confidence will act strong in the presence of God, and heavenly knowledge will distill upon our souls as the dews from heaven. The saints of God are acknowledged to be blameless by the only true blameless one, 
the Redeemer. This designation they received not because they never erred, but because of their trust in him and their willingness to keep his commandments and to give themselves in service to his people. The phrase in verse 27, redeem his people from their sins, meant sin is ever the enemy of salvation. Christ did not come to redeem people in their sins, but to redeem them from their sins. Salvation is like entrance into the temple, all invited to enter and receive its blessings. But none can do so unless they are striving to keep themselves from sin. Chapter 5, verse 28. The question, are ye stripped of pride? Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, quote, As spoken in the Revelations, pride is the opposite of humility. It is inordinate self-esteem arising because of one's position, achievements, or possessions. It has the effect of centering a person's heart on the things of the world rather than the things of the Spirit. As humility, which is an attribute of godliness possessed by true saints, leads to salvation, so pride, which is of the devil, leads to damnation. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the hum humble. End of quote. Pride, one of the deadly sins, the others being covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. They are considered fatal to spiritual progress. Pride is the state or quality of being proud, possessing or showing too great self-esteem, arrogant, haughty, lordly, insolent, overbearing, supercilious, disdainful, exhibiting scorn for those considered inferior. Pride implies a position to claim more consideration than is due. It also involves, by inference, a contemptuousness for the weaker or the little things of life so considered. It exhibits an excessive vanity, which leads to boasting and an arrogant display of one's power, skill, influence, or the like. The phrase, the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, meant, in one sense, this meant to the Nephites that Christ, the king of all the earth, would come into mortality. In another sense, it means that each of us, as we face the time of death, must reckon with ourselves in regard to the commandments of God. That is, we know not the day nor the hour in which our experience in mortality will end. No one knows their death date. Be it a few years or many, as mortals count them, the time spent on earth will seem all too short. The phrase is not being used in this text with the same meaning given to it by the Baptist who declared, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John's reference was to the reestablishment of the church of Jesus Christ among those of the nations of Israel. Chapter 9. Chive has to be chapter 5, verse 29. Sorry. We got a <clears throat> typo there. The question, are you stripped of pride and envy? Envy, when used throughout scriptures, the Book of Mormon and the Bible, means a discontent at the excellence or good fortune of another. Frequently in both volumes, it is used with the dis distinct understanding of malice or spite. Jealousy is often used to replace its use or vice versa. The antidote to virtually every spirituality, spiritual ill is charity. When the people of the Lord's fold are filled with pure love, they seek to build up one another, take joy in the accomplishments or acquisitions of another, and feel no desire to have more than they need. Some of the most serious sins known to mankind, such as murder and adultery, are generally due to pride and envy and covetousness. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that both that envy born of worldly influences stands in opposition to God's perfect love. He said, quote, it has been said that envy is the one sin to which no one readily confesses. But just how widespread that tendency can be is suggested in the old Danish proverb, if envy were a fever, all the world would be ill. As others seem to grow larger in our sight, we think we must therefore be smaller. So unfortunately, we occasionally act that way. How does this happen, especially when we wish so much that it would not? I think one of the reasons is that every day we see allurements of one kind or another that tell us what we have is not enough. 
Someone or something is forever telling us we need to be more handsome or more wealthy, more applauded or more admired than we see ourselves as being. We are told we haven't collected enough possessions or gone to enough fun places. We are bombarded with the message that on the world scale of things, we have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. But God does not work this way. I testify that no one, uh, that not one of us is less treasured or cherished of God than another. I testify that he loves each of us in securities, anxiety, self-image, and all. He doesn't measure our talents or our looks. He doesn't marriage our profession, measure our professions or our possessions. He cheers on every runner, calling out that the race is against sin, not against each other. I know that if we will be faithful, there is a perfectly tailored robe of righteousness ready and waiting for everyone. Robes made white in the blood of the Lamb. May we encourage each other in our effort to win that prize. End of quote. Chapter 5, verses 30 through 31. Is the quote, Is there one among you that doth make a mock of his brother? Verse 30. Alma warned against cheating a brother with scorn or contempt. Verse 31, On them that delight in deriding a brother, thus making him the butt of mirth or diversion, and thereby holding him up for ridicule in his efforts in keeping the Lord's commandments, he pronounced woe, which he implied would surely follow such ungodly actions. Alma further denounced any attempt made to belittle a brother in the eyes of the saints. He cautioned church members of the greatness of the sin committed in so doing, and called upon the offenders to repent without delay. There is something very unchristian about poking fun at each other. It is an unholy practice to make a man an offender for a word, to delight in the faults or weaknesses of another, or to laugh at or scorn the unfortunate. Such things are alien to the Spirit of God, and those who continue in them will come short of the glory of God. Chapter 5, verse 33, the phrase, He sendeth an invitation unto all men. From Adam to the last person to be born on this mortal earth, none will be left without the opportunity to hear the gospel of salvation. True, many will depart this life without having had that chance, yet in the providence of a just God, that opportunity will be offered them in the world of spirits before the day of judgment and resurrection. To all such, the gospel will be taught as it would have been taught them on earth. Those in the world of spirits who, if they had the opportunity, would have accepted the gospel mortality and lived its principles with integrity will do so there, and no blessings given to the righteous will be lost to them. Any theology that fails to attest to this principle is unworthy of a just and loving God. The testimony of the prophets of all ages is that God has invited all to come unto him and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him, black, white, bond, free, male, female. And he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. All who have inherited death from Adam's fall can have the promise of salvation through Christ's atonement. The phrase, the arms of mercy, means the arm of mercy is a metaphor carrying essentially the same meaning, seen as, same meaning as the promise that Christ would have healing in his wings. That is, having broken the bands of death and conquered all the limitations of mortality, Christ is now in a position to extend those same blessings to all who come unto him. Chapter 5, verse 34, the phrase, the fruit of the tree of life. In the Gal allegory of Eden, Christ is the tree of life, and to partake of the fruit is to partake of the cleansing power, powers of Christ and to receive the blessings of his spirit. In his bread of life sermon given at Capernaum, Christ declared, Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die, referring to himself. In a broader sense, the entirety of the gospel is the fruit we obtain from Christ, who is the source of eternal life. Chapter 5, verse 35, the phrase, Bring forth works of righteousness. 
If the seed is from the tree of life, it will bring forth fruit like that of its parent tree. Indeed, every seed bringeth forth unto its own likeness. Those who have truly chosen to follow Christ will bring forth fruits worthy of Christ. Once individuals have been born again, once the Spirit of the Lord has begun to bring down, to bring up about the mighty chains, once they have become new creatures in Christ, Christ begins to live in them. That is, their works become his works. They are motivated and given meaning and substance and effect by him through the power of his spirit. Chapter 5, verse 37, the phrase, profess to have known the right, I'm sorry, profess to have known the ways of righteousness. Like a fire that gives no warmth, the profession of faith without the attending action purges no sins and merits no place in the heavenly kingdom. The Lord hates sham and hypocrisy, and his wrath is kindled against such. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of dissolution, of weeping, of mourning, of lamentation. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house it shall go forth, saith the Lord. First among, among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know the name and have not known me. And have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. In other words, the cleansing of this earth will first start with the cleansing of Christ's church and the hypocrites therein. Chapter 5, verse 38, the phrase, In his own name that he doth call you. Behold, section 18 of Dr. Covenant says, Jesus Christ is the name which is given of the Father, and there is none other name given whereby man can be saved. Wherefore, all men must take upon them the name which is given of the Father, for in that name shall they be called at the last day. Wherefore, if they know not the name by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom of my Father. Entrance in the kingdom of heaven requires that we take upon ourselves the name of Christ. Name can also refer to authority. We take upon Christ's authority. Salvation is found in no other name or in no other authority. The significance of this proclamation is worthy of careful consideration. How is it that the power of salvation is invested in a name? Be it remembered that Christ in his mortal ministry was careful to establish the fact that he came in his Father's name, that all his works were done in the name of the Father, and that he sought to glorify the name of the Father in all he did. Thus the Son assured the name and power of his Father, and through the name and by that divine investiture, he extended the promise of salvation to all who would take upon themselves his name, as he had taken upon himself the name of the Father. Such is the system of salvation. God, the Eternal Father, placed his name upon Jesus of Nazareth, his only begotten in the flesh, and by so doing testified the Galilean was his own son, that the love and protection of heaven would be with him. Christ, a rightful heir to the dominion, to return to the heavenly family of which they were once, I'm sorry, to the dominion, power, and glory of the Father, of his Father, was empowered to act in the divine name. In turn, the Savior invites all his earthly brothers and sisters to return to that heavenly family of which they were once a part, to take again the family name and become heirs of the blessings associated with it. Thus salvation centers in our accepting Christ as our Savior, being born again into the family of the Father through the waters of baptism and living worthy of all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, wherein we are endowed with the powers of heaven. Those rejecting such, like the rebellious children in the families of men, will be disinherited from the royal family of heaven and left to seek citizenship in some other kingdom. Chapter 5, verse 39, the phrase, A Child of the Devil. We march with the army of Israel or the army of Satan. There is no middle ground, brothers and sisters. We accept Jesus as the Christ and follow him, or we do not. There is no compromise in that great war that began in heaven. We have not chosen to follow Christ. If we have not chosen to follow Christ, we have chosen to follow another. And there is none other to follow, save it be the devil. 
just as we can take upon us the name of Christ and become the sons and daughters of Christ and heirs to his kingdom, so we can choose to take upon us the name of the adversary and become heirs of his kingdom. Thus Cain, through his rebellion, took upon himself the name perdition, as will others who, like Cain, receive the fullness of the gospel and then choose to deny it and war against it. Just as the people of Zion are eventually sold to Christ, so the municipals of Babylon who deny and defy the truth shall eventually be sealed to Beelzebub. Chapter 5, verse 42. Whosoever doeth this must receive wages of him. And the laborer is worthy of his hire, and in the vineyard of our Lord he will receive a just reward. That reward is eternal life in God's kingdom. However, he that works for the devil must accept and will be paid with that which the devil has to give, namely death, death to things pertaining unto righteousness, death to even the desire to do good, but to do evil continually. We can understand this thoroughly when we remember that whatsoever is good cometh from God, and whatsoever is evil cometh from the devil. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The phrase, being dead unto all good works, meant, that is, they are spiritually dead, inert to righteousness and the ways of the righteous. Good works are essential to salvation. To merely believe in God and Christ makes us no better than the devils. If they did not have a sure knowledge of the eternal Father's only begotten Son, they would have no need to war against them. Chapter 5, verse 44, the phrase, the holy order of God, meant the holiest order of God is the Melchizedek priesthood. Before the day of Melchizedek, this priesthood was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. Melchizedek, we are told, having been approved of God, was ordained and high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with any, it being after the order of the Son of God, which order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor by mother, meaning you don't get it by lineage, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God, and it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. Anyone can receive the holy Melchizedek priesthood that are males that are worthy of it. You don't have to come from a special lineage. It is marvelously significant that the word order constitute parts of the proper name of the priesthood. The Lord's house is a house of order, and all that is done in the midst must be done in proper and orderly fashion. Such words as ordained and ordinance, which are associated with the governing of the church, are rooted in the word order. The holy order of God is the priesthood. It is the priesthood received by the young elder, the priesthood associated with the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, and the fullness of priesthood bestowed upon those ordained kings and priests of the Most High God. The theme of the verses that follow is that of necessity there must be authority that controls and governs the manner in which the gospel is taught. That system is announced anew and in a modern revelation which declares that those preaching the word are to do so saying another thing than that which the prophets and apostles have written and that which is taught them by the comforter through the prayer of faith. Thus we teach from the scriptures, we partake of their spirit, the spirit of revelation, and our minds are enlightened. And we are then able to expound, expand, and apply the message of heaven to the circumstances and situation of those we are teaching. The scriptures are the seedbed for revelation. The classic illustration of this principle for our day came by the way of instruction to three of the early missionaries of the church. My servant Orson Hyde, the revelation begins, was called by his ordination to proclaim the everlasting gospel by the spirit of the living God from people to people, from land to land, in the congregations of the wicked, in their synagogues, reasoning and expounding all scripture unto them. And behold and lo, this is an example unto all those who are ordained unto this priesthood, whose mission is appointed unto them to go forth. And this is the example unto them that they shall speak as they are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And whatsoever they shall speak when moved upon by the Holy Ghost shall be Scripture, shall be the will of the Lord, shall be the mind of the Lord, shall be the word of the Lord, shall be the voice of the Lord, and the power of God unto salvation. 
Behold, this is the promise of the Lord unto you, O my servants. Wherefore, be of good cheer, and do not fear, for I, the Lord, am with you, and will stand by you. And ye shall be record, bear record of me, even Jesus Christ, that I am the Son of the living God, that I was, that I am, and that I am to come. This is the word of the Lord unto you, my servant Orson Hyde, and also unto my servant Luke Johnson, and also my servant Lyman Johnson, and to my servant William E. McClellan, and unto all the faithful elders of my church. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, acting in authority which I have given you, baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The revelation is most instructive. In it, we see again the divine order. The gospel is taught from the scriptures and by the Spirit. When it is taught in th that manner, additional revelation readily comes to expound and explain the revelations previously given. This is the reason why there cannot be a closed canon. As long as the elders of Israel have the spirit of revelation, that spirit by which the scriptures are given will find the canon of scriptures forever growing. It is in this spirit, Elder, Bru Elder Boyd K. Packer referred to the Doctrine and Covenants as the book that will never be closed. We also note in the Revelation just cited that this is a system by which the gospel is to be taught among the people of the earth, whether righteous or wicked. Since we believe in continuous revelation, we will have continuous scripture. Chapter 5, verse 46 through 48, the phrase, I say unto you, they are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. A knowledge of the scriptures alone does not make one a competent witness of the verity of gospel principles. A witness from the Spirit can stand independent of all else. The testimony of the scriptures is always to be sustained by a living testimony, the manifestation of the Spirit to the one declaring the scriptures. The crowning, convincing, converting power of the gospel teaching, wrote Elder Bruce McConkie, is manifest when an inspired teacher says, I know by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the revelations of the Holy Spirit to my soul, that the doctrines I have taught are true. This divine seal of approval makes the spoken world binding upon the hearers. It should be added that when the Lord's servants preach in power by the promptings of the Holy Spirit, the Lord adds his own witness to the truth of their words. That witness comes in the form of signs and gifts and miracles. Such are always found when the preached word given in power is believed by hearers with open hearts. End of quote. Alma had seen an angel, but he testified in Alma 5, 46 7, that it was fasting and prayer that had allowed him to come to know, not seeing an angel. President Heber J. Grant explained, quote, Many men say, if I could only see an angel, if I could only hear an angel proclaim something that would cause me to be faithful all the days of my life. It had no effect upon these men, Lamel and Lamel, that were not serving the Lord, and it would have no effect today. End of quote. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained why the Holy Ghost can be more powerful than the visitation of angels. He said, quote, Christ declared that the manifestations we might have from a visitation of an angel, a tangible resurrected being, would not leave the impression which we received through the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Personal visitations might come, become dim as time goes on, but this guidance of the Holy Ghost is renewed and continued day after day year after lay, year, if we live to be worthy of it. It is the Holy Ghost that burns doubt out of our hearts, brothers and sisters, not just reading the scriptures. The spirit of revelation is communication from God to man by the power of the Holy Ghost to the mind and heart. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described how to recognize communication from the Holy Ghost. Quote, an impression to the mind is very specific. Detailed words can be heard or felt and written as though the instructions were being dictated. A communication to the heart is a more general impression. The Lord often begins by giving impressions. Where there is a recognition of their importance and they are obeyed, one gains more capacity to receive more detailed instruction to the mind. An impression to the heart is followed, is fortified by more specific instruction to the mind. End of quote. 
chapter 5, verse 50, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. The ultimate fulfillment of these prophetic words is the establishment of the millennial kingdom, a time when Christ will come in glory, might, majesty, power, and dominion to rule and reign as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In a limited sense, however, the kingdom of God would come when Jesus would come to earth in four score years' time. In another sense, the coming of the kingdom of heaven is equally close for men of all ages. That is so because those who live well, those who choose to repent and honor their God and his Christ, irrespective of when they live or how long they live, will obtain citizenship in the heavenly kingdom hereafter. They are prepared at the time of death to meet their maker and enjoy association with the faithful of past day, ages past. Those who spurn the truth and reject the prophets, on the other hand, enter into hell at the time of death and are confronted by the reality of their sins. It is for them as though they had lived to behold the great and dreadful day of the second coming of the Lord in glory. Alma 5 verse 52 Alma's declaration was not just that the wicked shall be destroyed, but that all who failed to bring forth works of righteousness will be as the tree hewn down and cast into the fire. As there is no neutrality where the kingdom of God is concerned, so no lack of commitment is acceptable where righteous where right and proper works are needed. The Apostle Paul, teaching the same principle, charged the Meridian saints to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. The phrase, an unquenchable fire, referred to, only the sons of perdition are damned forever in outer darkness. All other divine punishments and suffering, even that denominated as endless and eternal, will terminate at the time of the second resurrection. Those who will eventually inherit the telestial kingdom suffer and repent in hell after death. The prophet Joseph Smith observed, A man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they should go into a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake of burning with fire and brimstone. I say, so is the torment of man. Chapter 5, verses 53 through 54, the phrase, Vain things of the world. Fain is defined as empty, worthless, having no substance, value, or importance, elated with a high opinion of one's own accomplishments. Elder Dallin H. Oaks, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, counseled Latter-day Saints to avoid becoming preoccupied with the vain things of the world. Quote, Jesus taught that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Consequently, we should not lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth where moss and doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. In other words, the treasures of our hearts, our priorities, should not be what the scriptures call riches and the vain things of the world. The vain things of the world include every combination of that worldly quartet of property, pride, prominence, and power. As to all these, the scriptures remind us that you cannot carry them with you. We should be seeking the kind of scripture the scriptures promise the faithful, great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. End of quote. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland also quoted that vanity of physical appearance is spiritually dangerous. Quote, in terms of preoccupation with self and a fixation on the physical, this is more than social insanity, it is spiritually destructive, and, is, and it accounts for much of the unhappiness in the modern world. And if adults are pre preoccupied with appearance, tucking and nipping and implanting and remodeling everything that can be remodeled, those pressures and anxieties will certainly seep through to children. At some point, the problem becomes what the Book of Mormon calls vain imaginations. And in secular society, both vanity and imagination run wild. One would truly need a great and spacious makeup kit to compete with beauty as portrayed in media all around us. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 57, the phrase, Come ye out from the world, and be ye separate. Elder David R. Stone of the 70s discussed how techniques used in the construction of the Manhattan New York Temple provide an example of how to remove oneself from the influence of the world. Quote, Too many of the people of the world have come to resemble the Babylon of old by walking in their own ways and following a God whose image is in the likeness of the world. 
One of the greatest challenges we will face is to be able to live in that world, but somehow not be of that world. We have to create Zion in the midst of Babylon. My involvement with the building of the Manhattan Temple gave me the opportunity to be in the temple quite often prior to the dedication. It was wonderful to sit in the slush room and be there in perfect silence without a single sound to be heard coming from the busy New York streets outside. How was it possible that the temple could be so reverently silent when the hustle and bustle of the metropolis was just a few yards away? The answer was in the construction of the temple. The temple was built within the walls of an existing building, and the inner walls of the temple were connected to the outer walls at only a few junction points. That is how the temple Zion limited the effects of Babylon or the world outside. There may be a lesson here for us. We can create the real Zion among us by limiting the extent to which Babylon will influence our lives. Whenever we, wherever we are, whatever city we may live in, we can build our own Zion by the principles of the celestial kingdom and ever seek to become the pure in heart. We do not need to become as puppets in the hands of the culture of the, of the place and time. We can be courageous and can walk in the Lord's path and follow his footsteps. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 57, the phrase, touch not their unclean things, meant sin is born in, touching, in the touching stage of the tree of life. Adam and Eve were commanded, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. As with our first parents, so with us, we cannot partake of forbidden fruit, save we first touched them. To refuse to touch an offense is the fence of safety. Many a bitter tear has been shed by those who thought it cute to flirt with sin or nibble at that which is forbidden. 57, 5, 5 verse 57, the phrase blotted out, being blotted out from the church is what we would today call being excommunicated. Chapter 5 verse 58, the phrase names of the righteous written in the book of life. Elabusa McConkie wrote, quote, The book of life, or Lamb's book of life, is the record kept in heaven which contains the names of the faithful and an account of the righteous covenants, deeds, uh, covenants and deeds. The book of life is the book containing the names of those who shall inherit eternal life. It is the book of eternal life. It is the book of the names of the sanctified, even them of the celestial world. Names of faithful saints are recorded in the book of life while they are yet in mortality, but those names are blotted out in the event of wickedness. He is talking about in heaven there is a literal book, and our names are literally, and our deeds are literally written down. This is not figurative. Chapter 5, verse 60, the phrase, Suffer no ravenous wolves to enter among you. The honest and sincere truth seekers always welcome in the congregation of the saints. During his visit among the Nephites, for instance, Christ commanded them to meet together oft and added, Ye shall not forbid any man from coming in among you when ye shall meet together, but suffer them that they may come unto you and forbid them not. But ye shall pray for them and shall not cast them out. And if it so be that they come unto you oft, ye shall pray for them unto the Father in my name. Such a commandment does not suppose that we would welcome a wolf among us. We have no obligation to provide the devil with a platform to promote falsehood and advocate sin, nor can we tolerate the desires of evil and conspiring men who seek to prey upon the saints. A wolf has no place among the saints of God. Wow, that is a dot. A chapter certainly full of doctrine. Let's now turn to Alma chapter 6, a short chapter, verse 1, the phrase ordained by the laying on of hands. Ordination, that is, the formal ritual by which the priesthood it offers or the rites of presence here conferred must be done by the laying on of hands, such as the order of heaven. The laying on of hands constitutes a visual and documentable event whereby the authority of the priesthood can be traced back to the Lord from whence it came. The hands laid upon the heads of the recipient of the ordination are a symbolic representation of the hands of the Lord. Great symbolism in that. Chapter 6, verse 4, the order of the church. The order of the church is maintained and manifests through ordinances and ordinations. One does not 
capriciously lay claim to authority or priesthood office, nor can one receive the ordinance of salvation without properly complying with commandments and appropriate procedures governing their performance. Chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, the word of God was liberal unto all. That phrase, in teaching the gospel, there is to be no distinction between the rich and the poor. The word of God is to be freely and generously given to all, regardless of social standing. Just note, notice how that is depicted in the temple. We're all dressed the same or dressed in white. No, better, no one has better clothing than another person. We're all equal and on equal standing in the temple. James of the New Testament said, For if there come unto you assembly a man with a gold ring and God goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say unto the poor, Stand there, stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are becoming judges of evil thoughts? Mormon, the abridger of Alma's record, makes it plain that no one was deprived of the privilege of assemblage where he might hear the word of God. Alma recognized this truth that it is not only the right of church members to acquaint themselves with the things of God, but it is also their duty. They were in fact commanded to meet together off to learn more of heaven's exalted plan, and too with fasting, fervently invoking God's blessings upon those who knew not the Lord their God. Chapter 6, verse 6, the phrase, the children of God. This phrase is appropriate in both a literal and figurative sense. Because both Adam and Eve rightfully claim God as their father, and because we descend from them, we are spoken of in the scriptures as the children of God. In this instance, however, reference is to baptized members of the church, those who by covenant have been born again and thereby received into the family of Jesus Christ. See Mosiah 5, 1 through 7 on becoming begotten sons and daughters of Christ. Now our final chapter, Alma chapter 7. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 2. Seeing that it is the first time that I have spoken unto you by the words of my mouth. That phrase, this verse implied that Alma has had little or no opportunity to speak personally to this group before. His references to speaking in my language and by my own mouth indicate that as the chief judge or governor, as well as the president or presiding high priest of the church, he had either sent his word by messengers or had his directives or sermons delivered to all parts of the land by his servants. Chapter 7, verse 3, the phrase continued in, continued in the supplicating of his grace. That is, Alma's desire is that the people of Gideon have maintained their trust in and reliance upon the mercy and grace of the divine Redeemer. The power by which individuals are cleansed and purified from sin at baptism, the atoning power of Christ the Lord, given as a free gift, is the same power by which individuals retain a remission of their sins from day to day after baptism. However, and notwithstanding the joy that was Alma's in the triumph of right and righteousness over the powers of hell that had been leading many of the saints in Zarahemla to destruction, he expressed an added joy in the faithfulness of these saints who lived in the land of Gideon. In Gideon, Alma found none in distress, whose needs were not being taken care of. There was no class distinction among the saints. Unlike many church members of Zarahemla, their unselfish labors to ameliorate the sufferings of those in need to benefit and better their condition was a sacrifice of which the Lord approved then to it put to the highest use of the gifts of God had vouchsafed the saints in Gideon. Chapter 7 verse 5 the phrase I shall also have joy over you. Alma discerns by the power of the Spirit that the people in this city are more spiritually prepared to receive the word than those were in Zarahemla. No doubt the light of spiritual receptivity, the emanating powers of goodness and humility shone in the faces of some of the congregation. The joy of which Alma spoke of came to him not by wading through much affliction and sorrow as he was compelled to do so in Zarahemla, but was because of the righteousness he found among the saints in Gideon. Thus this led Alma to speak of greater spiritual things in Gideon because the people were more prepared to hear the pleasing word of God. Hence, in one sense, we as the people of the church decide what the brethren speak on based upon our obedience and diligence to the principles of the gospel. 
So what the brothers speak on general conference is determined by how we in the church are living collectively. And so in that one general conference, when the very first talk by President Nelson was on abuse, physical abuse, spirit, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, and how that needs to stop in the church was not a good sign of our spirituality in the church. Chapter 7, verse 6, the phrase, I trust that you look forward with an everlasting faith. The word trust, as used here, means confidence in the integrity or acts of another. The assurance relied on their moral soundness, their justice and veracity, the assured anticipation of something. Alma expressed assurance that the saints in Gideon would continue in well-doing in observing the Lord's commandments, that they would not, as the brethren of Samuel had, worship the idols, but bowed down to and worship the true and living God. He also assured them that the remission of their sins would come to all those who looked forward continually with an eye of faith, having in view those things of which the prophets had long spoken. Again, this enabled Alma to speak of greater spiritual things than what he had to preach in Zarahemla. Chapter 7, verse 7, the phrase, there is one thing which is of more importance than they all, meant Joseph Smith taught that the fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven. All other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. All doctrines and principles and practices have meaning, are of efficacy, virtue, or force only to the degree that are rooted in and anchored to the atonement of Jesus Christ. In the, world, in the words of Elder Boyd K. Packer, quote, Truth, glorious truth, proclaims there is mediator. Through him, mercy can be fully extended to each of us without offending the eternal law of justice. This truth is the very root of Christian doctrine. You may know much about the gospel as its branches out from there, but if you only know the branches and those branches do not touch that root, if they have been cut off from that truth, there will be no life nor substance nor redemption in them. End of quote. Alma's testimony of the Redeemer lives as a witness that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal Son of God. He is the Messiah in whom all Israel rejoice and who waiteth his coming. His advent was all, of all things most important, that he lives as the greatest of all prophetic utterances. Thank God he liveth and cometh among his people. Anything we teach, any doctrines or principles of the gospel, if they do not bring us unto Christ, if they do not get us to focus on Christ, if they do not help us to remember Christ, then they are of no worth whatsoever. Everything, brothers and sisters, has to be about Jesus Christ. It cannot be about us. Everything has to be about Him. Our lives must focus on Him continually. Chapter 7, verse 8, the phrase, I do not say that he will come among us at the time of his dwelling in his mortal tabernacle. Alma was constrained by the spirit of prophecy which was within him to offer the foregoing qualification. There were some who in mistaken zeal expected the Messiah immediately upon birth to take up his abode among them. They did not understand God's purposes. This caused much dissension among the Nephites and some of the believing Lamanites who wondered why Christ, of whose coming they looked forward to, should be born in a land they only knew by name and by hearsay. Some termed his coming a wicked tradition and spoke of it as a deception to enslave us and to keep us in ignorance all the days of our lives. See, this way you gotta have to understand true doctrine. Prophecy, we should note, not only heralds the future, but also it interprets the past. And in addition, it explains difficult passages of Scripture. In this case, the spirit of prophecy had not made known to Alma the time in the life of the Redeemer wherein he should come among his people in, the, in their new land of promise. But however, that spirit had manifested him that Christ would come at not far distant time. Of this Alma was sure. He knew the Lord God, whose servant he was, hath power to do all things which he had promised. Therefore Alma spoke with knowledge and understanding. He taught them that he would be born in Jerusalem and raised there and die there and resurrected. And then he would come and visit the Nephite people. Chapter 7, verse 10, the phrase, at Jerusalem. 
These words have spawned a host of heckles and sneers directed at the Book of Mormon. Persons of a, of a skeptical and cynical spirit asked, Didn't Joseph Smith know that Jesus was born of Mary in Bethlehem? We answer yes. He was born in Bethlehem, but he was also born at Jerusalem, meaning that Bethlehem, the smaller community, was within the environs of Jerusalem, the larger city. In our day, it would be as if someone from Sandy or Pro or even Provo, Utah, had said to someone somewhat unfamiliar with Huachat's front, I am from Salt Lake City. So the scripture is not wrong when Alma prophesies that Jesus will be born at Jerusalem. Bethlehem is at or around Jerusalem. It's only about a five-minute walk from Jerusalem. President Joel Finley Smith explained the location of the Savior's birth as declared by Alma, quote, There is no conflict or contradiction in the Book of Mormon with any truth recorded in the Bible. A carefully reading of what Alma said will show that he had no intention of declaring that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. Alma knew better. So did Joseph Smith and those who were associated with, with him in the bringing forth of the Book of Mormon. Had Alma said born in Jerusalem, the city of our fathers, it would have made all the difference in the world. Then we would have said he made an error. Alma made no mistake, and what he said is true. Dr. Hugh Nibley, in his course of study for the priesthood for 1957, in an approach to the Book of Mormon, Lesson 8, page 85, has this to say on this point. One of the favorite points of attack on the Book of Mormon has been the statement in Alma 710 that the Savior would be born at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers. Here Jerusalem is not the city in the land of our forefathers. It is the land. Christ was born in a village some six miles from the city of Jerusalem. It was not in the city, but it was in what we know the ancients themselves designated as the land of Jerusalem. So, so I'm sorry, the, the Beth, Bethlehem is about six miles uh, from Jerusalem. So a little more than five minutes to get there, but not very long. You can walk, certainly walk that easily. Chapter 7, verse 10, the phrase, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel. The term virgin has several different interpretations. In Hebrew, with which Nephi was undoubtedly familiar, the word Bethula, used by writers of that period, usually suggests to us an unmarried maiden. The, Ara the Ar Arabian root means to be mature, and the Aramaic does not connote virginity. The word apparently means one of marable age, and certainly not the word which would naturally be used if virginity were the point to be emphasized. Among those who had a profound respect for the law of Moses, and which was mixed with love and awe of the coming Messiah, it was a Jewish custom for them to, dedic for them to dedicate to the temple service a female child born under extraordinary circumstances. In the apocryphal Gospels, although legendary, they have a basis of facts surrounding their conclusions. We are told that Mary was miraculously granted to an aging, childless couple named jo Joachim and Anna, who were known for their piety and generosity. At the age of three years, she was dedicated to the Lord or to the temple service, where it is said that she was ministered to by angels from heaven, and where also she grew in wisdom and virtue. Those who were so set apart for such a service were called virgins. At the age of 12, Mary was betrothed to Joseph, a widower older than she. Certainly, just as Jesus was the chosen firstborn of the Father, greater than all the noble and great ones, so too it would make sense that Mary, the mother of the Son of God, was probably one of the choicest women in the pre-mortal world just as Christ was the choicest man. Mary was probably the choicest woman. Chapter 7, verse 10, the phrase, Who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus was the son of Mary, a mortal woman, and the, was the son of Elohim, the eternal father. He was not the son of the Holy Ghost, as some have supposed from the New Testament account. 
If the New Testament passage is interpreted to mean that the Holy Ghost is the Father of our Lord, Ella Bruce R. Cockney has written, we can only say the record has come down to us in a corrupted form, for the Holy Spirit and the Father are two separate personages. But providentially, there are parallel passages that clarify and expand upon the paternity of him whom Mary bore. The passages are, of course, in the Book of Mormon, particularly here in Alma 7. Continuing, Elder McConkie stated, Jesus thus is the Son of God, not of the Holy Ghost. And properly speaking, Mary was with child by the power of the Holy Ghost, rather than of the Holy Ghost. And she was, of course, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit in a way incomprehensible to us when the miraculous conception took place. In other words, the Holy Ghost had to overcome Mary so that she could be in the presence of Elohim the Father and then that she could be, uh, that she could conceive a child of Elohim the Father. Chapter 7, verses 11 through 12. The phrase, he will suffer our pains, afflictions, temptations, sickness, and infirmities. Elder Nile Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve, wrote of the Savior's familiarity with the afflictions of mortality and with our individual transgressions when he said, quote, He knows by actual personal experience, because not only did he suffer pains, afflictions, and temptations of every kind during his second estate, but he also took upon himself our sins as well as our pains, sicknesses, and infirmities. Thus he knew, not in abstraction, but in actuality, according to the flesh, the whole of human suffering. He bore our infirmities before we bore them. He knows perfectly how to succor us. He can t we can tell him nothing of pain, temptation, or affliction, or affliction. He learned according to the flesh, and his triumph was complete. End of quote. On another occasion, Elder Maxwell also said, quote, Can we even in the depths of disease tell him anything at all about suffering? In ways we cannot comprehend, our sicknesses and infirmities were borne by him, even before they were borne by us. The very weight of our combined sins caused him to descend below all things. We have never been, nor will we be, in the depths of such as he has known. Thus his atonement made perfect his empathy and his mercy, and his capacity to succor us, for which we can be everlastingly grateful as he tutors us, in our trials, end of quote. Brothers and sisters, we are not going to go back to our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ and tell him how hard mortality was. If we try to do that, he'll say, let me show you something that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then we will wither in humility that our sufferings were nothing compared to his Chapter 7, verse 12, the phrase, He will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. Notwithstanding that he was innocent, himself the great Messiah, Alma declared, would humbly submit to the penalty of sin, which is death, and substitute himself in the place of sinners, thereby releasing them from the chains of hell and of eternal damnation, which is the grave. The penalty of sin is not only physical death, but also spiritual death, meaning being separated from God. Christ suffered both death, physical and spiritual death. That's why the Father Spirit had to leave Christ. Christ had to do it on his own. He had to know what it was like not to be without the Spirit of Heavenly Father. Because that's what happens to us when we sin. The Spirit withdraws from us. Well, it withdrew from the Savior also. Through God's grace, the Lord, even the Son of God, whom Alma proclaimed, would, when he should come, break the bands of death and loosen the chains of hell, which, with relentless fury, held fast in their inex inex inexorable grasp the bodies and spirits of men. The promise coming to this Lord was a sign of the faithful Nephites that all men should be set free from the bands of death and a messenger of peace to the oppressed that would be soon be delivered. They no longer feared death, nor did they depreciate it or shrink away from it. They reasoned as Paul, 150 years later, as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Teachings 
the phrase he may know according to flesh how to sucker his people. Teaching about the word suckle, sucker, Elder Jeffrey O. Holland stated, sucker is used often in the scripture to describe Christ's care for and attention to us. It means literally to run to. What a magnificent way to describe the Savior's urgent effort on our behalf. Even as he calls us to come to him and follow him, he is unfailing, running to help us. That is a beautiful phrase and insight. Chapter 7, verse 13, Now the Spirit knoweth all things. Even though the Savior knew intellectually what the atonement entailed, that there were some things associated with mortal life, physical testing and trials and pain and harassment and entanglement, in estrangement and embarrassment that the Lord Jehovah needed to experience firsthand. And so he came to earth. He came to suffer according to the flesh. The great God of the ancients condescended to walk among men that he might work out their own salvation and also to make the same available to those who would receive his word and trust in his redeeming grace. Though it is true, the Spirit knoweth all things. In other words, the Spirit probably showed Christ what he would go through in the pre-earth life. So he knew intellectually the atonement. The God of mercy needed to experience infirmity, weakness, sickness, personally in order to identify with and comfort his people, and often to deliver them from such things. Christ needed experiential knowledge. That's why when he walks into the garden and immediately falls flat on his face because of the weight of the atonement and the pain and suffering that hits him, and he yells out, my God, my God, no, I'm sorry, why he yells out, if it be possible, let this cat pass from me. He's now is experiencing what he intellectually knew, and this experience now, even to him, is probably more than he expected. And he wanted to make sure that he did not shrink. That's why he says if it would be possible. He's not trying to get out of it. He's trying to make sure that we are saved. Because if he gets halfway through the atonement and stops, then we're all damned in hell. But he says, nevertheless, thy will be done. And he suffers through and does not shrink. And so we too, brothers and sisters, through the midst of our infirmities, sickness, illnesses, whatever they may be, trials, that come, we, we must not shrink either and be faithful to God and remain faithful to him in the midst of our experiential sufferings. Chapter 7, verse 13, the phrase that he might take upon him the sins of his people in a way that we cannot comprehend. Jesus of Nazareth assumed the burden and consequence of sins of all mankind. The immediate consequence of sin is the withdrawal of the spirit. It may be that such a withdrawal from an individual is what leads to feelings of guilt and pain and emptiness. Jesus Christ, in taking upon him the effects of the sins of all mankind, was thus exposed to the awful and to Jesus' unusual withdrawal of the Spirit, which had been his constant companionship from the beginning. Christ had never known a day without knowing the Spirit of his Father with him. And now all of a sudden it's gone. President Brigham Young explained, quote, The Father withdrew his Spirit from his Son at the time he was to be crucified. At that very moment, at that hour, when the crisis came for him to offer up his life, the Father withdrew himself withdrew his spirit. That is what made him sweat blood. If he had had the power of God upon him, he would not have sweat blood. End of quote. Chapter 7, verse 14, the phrase, that ye may be washed from your sins. The scriptures seldom speak of having our sins washed away in the waters of baptism, though the saints frequently use this expression to teach the purpose of baptism. Perhaps the more useful analogy is that which attests to the Holy Ghost as the agent, the medium by which sins and dross are burned out of the human soul, as though by fire, thus giving to rise to the phrase, baptism by fire. Sins are remitted not in the waters of baptism, as we say casually, but rather as we receive the cleansing and sanctifying influence of the Spirit in our lives. 
let's stop it, brothers and sisters, at these baptismal ceremonies and giving a talk on baptism and saying, you kids, your sins are going to be washed away. First of all, they had none to be washed away. And second of all, the symbolism of baptism is being buried and rising again as Christ was buried and resurrected. We are buried in water and resurrected a new person in Christ. It's the Holy Ghost that washes our sins away, not the water. Let us please teach the doctrine correctly, because it is only correct doctrine taught correctly that will change behavior. Let us stop saying that your sins are going to be washed away in these waters. That is not the doctrine. Chapter 7, verse 15, the phrase, lay aside every sin. Alma is not counseling the people to put away their sins one at a time, a bit here and a bit there. This is the world's approach. It may sound commendable, but it is terrestrial at best. To be born again is to have our natures changed, not always immediately, but certainly in process of time. To lay aside every sin is to rid oneself of all sin and the desire for it, to put off all sinfulness, to confess and forsake sin, and to rely on the merits and mercy of the Holy Messiah. The phrase, and witness it unto him this day by going into the waters of baptism. Baptism is an ordinance of profound symbolism. In the purest sense, we are baptized to witness our willingness to accept Christ, to take upon us his name, and to commit ourselves to receive his atonement. We go down into the watery grave as a token and a remembrance of our master's descent into the tomb of death. We come forth as he did unto a newness of life. His a resurrected immortality, ours a sanctified mortality. Having been planted in the likeness of his death, we are thereby in the likeness of his resurrection. That's the true doctrine of baptism. Chapter nine, chapter 7, verse 19, the phrase, Ye are in the paths of righteousness. There are no perfect, there, there, they are not perfect, but are striving through their allegiance to and trust in Christ to become such. Like the people to whom Paul wrote, their salvation is nearer than when they initially believed the truth. They are on track. Their course is approved of God. The phrase, you are making us past straits, means righteousness prepares the way of the Lord. It builds faith, strengthens resolve, heightens commitment, and prepares the heart for the establishment of Zion. Chapter 7, verse 20. The phrase, he cannot walk in crooked paths, meant our Lord is absolutely dependable and everlastingly constant. His truths are eternal. His ways and doings are forever the same, and his purpose is unfailing. Though the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted is revelation, suited to the circumstances in which the children of the kingdom are placed, God's ways are never capricious, meaning changeable, fickle, never variable. On him we may rely with unshaken confidence. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can put our complete faith and trust in him. Chapter 7, verse 21, the phrase, He doth not dwell in unholy temples. That is, his spirit cannot abide with those who have violated their covenants or broken the commandments and remain, unrepent and remain un unrepent unrepentant. Its abode, whether in our hearts or elsewhere, must be spotless, its dwelling place pure and undefiled. The Holy Spirit giveth life and light. But just as disease breeds it in filth, so also in corruption, be evil begets spiritual disorder and often severe malady. Sin is spiritual filthiness. It destroys the soul. Death is sin, eternal companion. Every son and daughter of Father Adam must receive a just reward for deeds done in the mortal body. Eternal life in God's kingdom is the prize awarded the righteous, while the wicked or those who choose evil will reap everlasting punishment in a place of despair and anguish, which is hell. Hell is that place prepared for the devil and his angels. Satan is its chief architect and builder. The prophet Nephi said, The devil is the foundation of it. The devil is filthy. His children are also filthy. They become his children who do his bidding. By choice they elect to follow his ways, not by mandate. This choice extends after the death of the mortal body, and just so long as their choice is evil, they will remain filthy and must dwell forever in filthiness with those who remain in their wicked 
condition. Chapter 7, verses 23 through 24. Responsibilities of the Melchizedek Priesthood. Alma 7, 22 through 24 includes instruction to priesthood holders and a list of qualities they should possess to appropriately officiate in the priesthood. This instruction is similar to instruction given to the priesthood holders in Doctrine and Covenants 121, 41 through 42. These verses in Alma 7 and Doctrine and Covenants 121 help those who hold the priesthood know how to act to increase their power in the priesthood. President Boyd K. Packer, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the importance of living righteously as a priesthood holder. Quote, the priesthood is very, very precious to the Lord. He is very careful about how it is conferred and by whom. It is never done in secret. I have told you how the authority is given to you. The power you receive will depend on what you do with this sacred, unseen gift. Authority is given by the laying of hands. Power in the priesthood is acquired by our righteousness. Back to Indian Elder Packer's quote. Your authority comes through your ordination. Your power comes through your obedience and worthiness. End of quote. Chapter 7, verse 23. Temperate in all things. Elder Russell and Nelson remarked on the safety temperance brings. Temperance suggests sobriety and self-restraint in action. It reminds one of covenants made. Repeatedly, Scripture teaches that we be temperate in all things. Temperance can protect us from the aftermath of ex excess. End of quote. Chapter 7, verse 25, the phrase to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To us, to sit down with these ancient worthies is to qualify for their company and to be confident and at ease in their presence and to receive exaltation and godhood, for that is the condition and state of these patriarchs. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. Hopefully this helped you gain insights and receive inspiration on how to better live our lives. If this presentation helps you, please hit the like button.